How's that? Good. Oh, what a great day. I just so love having those kids come up here to do that. I'd rather do that. That was wonderful, wasn't it? Well, we're going to be in Mark chapter 15. The uh, Lord put it on my heart today just to, to read through what it is that we celebrate today, which is, of course, His resurrection. So that's what we want to do. Um, celebrate that, but also look at that together. So how about this? Let's pray first, and then we'll begin in Mark chapter 15. Lord God, we do thank you that you sent Jesus to die in our place. Thank you that he came to do what we could not do, live a sinless life, to live perfection for us. And then he paid the penalty for our sin on the cross. He died was buried and it rose again, as we will look at this morning. And we just pray, Lord, as we look at that, that you'd speak to our hearts and that you'd bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm just going to read a little bit, starting in verse 25 of Mark 15. We read, now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above the king of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroyed the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking among themselves with the scribes, said he saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of the Jews, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he is calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus cried out with a last voice. Uh, I'm sorry, with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from afar, among them, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the last son of Joseph, and Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen, and he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, observed where he was laid. So here we have where we left off early Friday night. We did a, a service here dealing with the crucifixion. Where our Lord Jesus was laid in a tomb. He had died. He was dead. And I just think, you know, the devil and his minions, oh, what a party they probably had. 
They thought, surely we are victorious. And it certainly looked that way. It looked like they were, uh, they had a chance. They had won. And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, I don't know how many of you like NASCAR. You guys like NASCAR? I, I'm not much of a, a race guy. They just go around and around in circles. I can go around and around in circles. I've done that a lot in my life. But NASCAR has never been something that really interested me. I have been to a race in Virginia once or twice. I go for the... Accidents, I and mean, what else is there, right? See, but then we get to chapter 16 here in Mark. And what we celebrate today, it says in verse 1 Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, Who will roll this away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You see Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is risen. Isn't that awesome? What a great thing to have heard. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. And there you will see him, as he said. He is risen. What a... What an amazing, overwhelming, dumbfounding, uh, stupendous thing that they had heard. What a shock it must have been to them and confusion, you know. They can see the evidence, but that doesn't happen. People die and they don't rise again. That doesn't happen. Now, we have had some people get resuscitated who died and very close to that. They, they have their, you know, chest compressions and all that. CPR, all that stuff that we can do, and 
and we brought them back from the brink of death. But it does not compute that someone who is dead could rise again. And I wonder, you know, who is the first to know? Who is the first one to see that Jesus had risen from the dead? Because, you know, we know on earth it was Mary, it was these ladies were aware of it, and then he appeared to Mary. But I was thinking, maybe it was the devil. And the devil's there, and he's having a party. You know, and I don't think it's a theatrical. You know how Hollywood would do it. Jesus, his finger would just start to move. And then, you know, no, I don't think so. I think it was just all of a sudden, boom, and he just stood up and, you know, killed the party for the devil. What an awesome thing that was. They thought they had won. And, of course, the devil now, he has to change his tactics. Now all he can do is try to attack us. He wants to destroy we who are created in God's image because he is a defeated foe. But I was saying, you know, was it maybe the saints who had already died? Because, see, death does not mean we cease to exist. That's not what happens. We continue with consciousness even. In Luke 16, there's a story of a rich man and Lazarus who had died. And the rich man went to a place of torment, but Lazarus he went to a place where he was comforted. We call it Abraham's bosom. It was a place where those who died in faith would go, waiting for the Messiah to come, waiting for his sacrifice to be made, because sin had not been paid for. And so the presence of God could not be entered into fully. And so they waited there. And I suspect that what happened in this time between the crucifixion and the resurrection Jesus went and had a conversation with those guys. Can you imagine what that would have been like? Now that would be a party. You mean we who are bound up here are suddenly set free, even though they were in a place of comfort. It wasn't what heaven is going to be. It wasn't what heaven is. So maybe it was then. I don't know. Scripture tells us that Jesus led captivity captive. And that's what it was. He went and talked to them. Now, as I said, on earth we know Mary Magdalene and whoever was with her, but it was her by herself. She thought he was a, a gardener, and he appeared to her. And then we read also in Luke's Gospel, there were a couple of guys on the road to Emmaus just talking about what had gone on, and Jesus kind of joins in with them. Why they didn't recognize him, I don't know, but they did not right away. And he had a good time. Well, that's a good story. That's a fun story to read, too. And then he appeared to his disciples. And everybody was there. In John chapter 20, I like this account, too. Because I identify with Thomas. Thomas wasn't there. I sometimes can be like him. In John chapter 20, verse 24. Well, I actually want to go before that. Maybe that whole section. Let's go to verse 19. Somebody changed my notes again. That's what happened. Uh, it says in John 20, verse 19, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now how can he get in there with the doors being locked? I don't know. That's kind of interesting. Oh boy, I'd love to do that. Can you imagine that just appear to someone? Hey, peace be with you. As your heart is falling out of your chest on the floor, you know. <laughs> and when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad. Now that's kind of an understatement, isn't it? I, I would like rejoice there, or but maybe they were just a little dumbfounded. I don't know. But they were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see his hands 
see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. And he said to Thomas, Reach your fingers here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. You ever have one of those times where you wish you had said something? I think that's what happened here with Thomas. He's like, eh, you guys, yeah, whatever, you tell me stories. Come on, he died. He's dead. There's no coming back from that. It doesn't happen. It's never happened. It isn't going to happen. And then Jesus appears. It's like, oh, I really don't need to put my hands there. No, I don't want to put my fingers there. No, I'm sorry. No, you know. But what a moment that must have been. An amazing moment. You know, that's, that's the question that we all have to, have to deal with. Are we like Thomas or are we not? Do we believe? See, because God, there is a God, and if God is God, God can do anything. He can raise the dead. He could raise his son, raise Jesus again. I have no problem. I do believe that. But consider, you know, the evidence. Because the evidence for the resurrection is really overwhelming. Both in Scripture and in other writings of that day, there's no doubt, you know, there's no doubt at all. Now, the tomb of, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, to which Jesus was buried on Friday, there's no doubt he was put in the tomb. There's no doubt he was dead. Pilate would never have surrendered the body to Joseph of Arimathea. The centurion, who those guys knew how to kill, he checked with him. Is he dead? Yes, he's dead. Okay, you can have the body. That's the way it happened. He was dead. The fact is, without dispute. So that tomb into which Jesus was buried on Friday was in fact empty on Easter morning, on that first morning, the morning of the resurrection. And how do we know the body of Jesus was gone? Well, you can, you can discover that by what the Jewish priests did. You know, they, they were confronted with that reality. That tomb was empty. All they had to do was drag everybody down to where they buried him and roll the stone away and say, look, there he is. No, he is not risen. They couldn't do that because there's no body there. The body was gone. So they concocted this story. You read about it in Matthew's Gospel. Let's just tell everybody his disciples stole the body. And so that was the story that the Roman soldiers agreed to declare. Yeah, that's it. His disciples stole it. Because the Romans didn't have it either. The Jews didn't have his body. The Romans didn't have his body But if the apostles, if his disciples had had his body, if they had actually stoned, I mean, stolen it, consider the reality that all of them suffered such great uh, persecution. And it would have been for a lie. They would have known it was a lie. Would you do that? Of course you wouldn't do that. And something happened to them that changed Because you consider who they were. They're in hiding. When Jesus appeared to them, they're behind a locked door. They're mourning his death, and they're hiding. He said, for fear of the Jews. They're afraid. They're coming after us next. You know? 
and something happened to them that changed a band of dejected, weak, and hiding men to the bold witnesses they became for Jesus Christ. Just a few weeks later, so Jesus said, wait, tarry in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. And so they had the testimony. They knew what they knew was true, and then they had the power of God that we read about in Acts chapter 2, that power that came upon them. And so the facts are this. A man named Jesus walked this earth. Nobody ever doubted that. Everybody knows that's a provable fact. Someone called Jesus did walk the earth. He declared himself to be God, and many of those that followed him said he was God. There's no disputing that fact either. The third fact, this man Jesus was put to death on the cross. He was murdered. That's, that's what happened to him. He was murdered. Nobody disputes that either. That was very common in that day. And he was buried in the tomb. Everybody agrees with that. The problem is, though he was dead, is he now alive? That's the thing that we, that's a provable fact too. He is alive. These facts are undeniable. So what does this mean? That's the question. What does this mean to you and what does it mean to me that some guy who lived a couple thousand years ago, claimed to be God, religious guys, Strolling around the countryside over there in Israel. What does that have anything to do with me today? If he was not God, it has nothing to do with you. But if Jesus is God, if he did fulfill, as he did, hundreds of prophecies about a Messiah to come, which he fulfilled exactly, then it has everything to do with who we are. Because he declared that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. We need to accept him as Lord of our life so that we can have that eternal life that the kids talked about. You know, that one of those verses, right? The one we all know, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's the issue. That's the point. That's the choice. Perish? Everlasting life. Not a big choice to me. I like the whole idea of everlasting life. That sounds like a good thing. And not perishing. In Acts chapter 2, on that day of Pentecost, on that day when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples, it made such a ruckus that everybody gathered around. And Peter delivered this sermon. And we'll pick it up at verse 22. Where Peter's speaking, he said, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands. Have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because. It was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ 
to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you, and to your children, and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And it goes on from there, you know, that many other words he testified, he exhorted, he shared with them. He talked to them. But you know, they, they were cut to the heart. They realized it's our Messiah. And he has been crucified, but he rose again. They believed his testimony. So what do we do now? How do we respond to that? And that's a simple response there. He said, repent. Repent. That word means to turn around, to change direction, go a different direction than the direction you're going. Stop living your life for you. Start living your life for Him. And it said, repent and be baptized. And I, I, you know, from this verse, some have concluded that you must be baptized to be saved. And that's not entirely true. It's important to get baptized. But what baptism is, is a declaration. When you are baptized, you are saying that I identify with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You're making a statement of faith that you trust Jesus. And the word baptized means immersed. And so he's saying just be immersed in who Jesus is. Get to know who, get to know him. And, get, and live for him. And so what does scripture declare to us? How do we? What do we do? How do we repent? What do we do? The first thing, we have to acknowledge that we're sinners. You know, Romans 3.23, it says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody has. We've all sinned. And then understand there is a penalty for sin. The scripture declares for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Consider the reality of God's love. Romans 5, 8. For God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What a great testimony that is. Even though, with our free will, we can reject this gift of love. And many do. God demonstrated it anyway in the person of Jesus Christ. And then in Romans chapter 10, good place to look to if you have your Bible. In Romans 10, verse 1, Paul, writing this book under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for, to God for Israel is that they may be saved. I want my countrymen. You know, I have that desire for my countrymen. That desire for the people that live in my state here. My heart's desire, pray to God for Israel, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. You know, they're doing all these great works, but they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand what they are doing. Verse 3 says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness 
and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. They're doing all these religious acts. They're doing all these wonderful things, thinking that it's a blessing to God. And yet, in doing that, they're trying to establish their own righteousness, their own right standing with God. They had this idea that if I can just do enough good things, when I get to heaven, God will let me in. Long as the good things outweigh the bad things. And there's so many that have that philosophy still today. Long as I'm a good person, I'm all set. But that's not what the scripture says. Let me demonstrate it this way. How many lies does it take to be a liar? Is it 5,000? Is it 50? 10? One? One lie makes you a liar. It's true, right? Have you always told the truth? Yes. Yeah, well, except that one time. Well, then you lie. Yes. Does that make you? Yes. It makes you lie. How many things do you have to steal to be a thief? Ten? Six? Five? One little package of Susie Q's like I did in eighth grade? <laughs> you know, that's all it takes. A thief. I did it. I've done that. There were other things, but that, that's what I'm thinking of at the moment. But, you know, how many things do we have to steal to be a thief? Just one. And how many sins do we have to commit to be a sinner? It's only one. That's the reality of the circumstance that humanity is in. It only takes one sin to be a sinner. It's easy to convince people they're a sinner because we all know we've all sinned. We all have. We're all sinners. The issue is what do we do with sin? And how many sins does it make, take to make you a sinner? One. Just one. That's a terrible predicament to be in. And that's what's so important about the resurrection. That's what's so important about this day. Because see, this is what it says. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. See, we don't have to live perfect. We need to try to. That's a good thing. But Jesus lived perfect for us. He did that. Because we can't. That's the purpose of the law. That's the purpose of all of the law is to show us we can't do it. It's not enough power to be perfect. We're tarnished. <laughs> We're damaged. We're messed up. It goes all the way back to our father Adam, way back in the Garden of Eden, that original sin. It has been passed down through every generation, even to us. We're, we're all susceptible to doing wrong. But Christ, he did righteousness for us. We can never make ourselves righteous. We can never do enough good. We can never wash the slate clean. But Jesus, he did that for us. He's the one that attained the pathway. He's the one that restored the relationship to God. He did it for us. And so the next question in you know, this Roman road that I've been taking you through, all right then, what do I have to do? How do I get eternal life? And in Romans 10 still, in verse 9 and 10, it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's a simple way. It's not anything we have to do. It's not what you do, it's who you know. Do you know Jesus? That's the question. That's always the question. It's a confession. It is what Peter said in Acts 2. We need to repent. We need to turn from our sin. We need to be sorry for those things that we have done. We need to repent. And we need to invite Jesus into our life. He needs to be the Lord of our life. 1 John 5. Last scripture I'll share with you. 1 John 5. This is where it declares how easy it is to become a Christian. 
and to be a Christian and to know if you're a Christian. It's simple. 1 John 5, verse 11, and this is the testimony. This is it. That God has given us eternal life. The gift is there. It's yours. Eternal life, you can have it. God has given it to us, but this life is in His Son. It's only found in Jesus. There's no other way. It's in His Son. He who has the Son has life. So that's it. And he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. It's as simple as that. You have Jesus. Pray with me. Let's do it. Let's bow our heads and pray. And I just want to ask you, because I don't do this very often, but I thought it would be a good thing to do today, just to check. Is there anyone here today that would say, I need to get serious about Jesus. That I need... Jesus in my life. Is there anyone here, maybe at one time you prayed a prayer, but you've drifted away from God, and He's not in the place that He should be in your life. You've been a prodigal. You've been off serving yourself. And you want to come home. Or maybe you've never asked Jesus to be Lord of your life. Maybe you're thinking that if Jesus returned today, and everything ended, or if my life ended today, I'm not sure that I would go to heaven. You can be sure. If you have the Son, you have life. If you'd like me to pray with you, to invite Jesus into your life, just let me know by raising your hand. That's simple. Just let me know, because I want to pray with you. If anyone can feel that tug on their heart. You're among friends here. You're among family here. We're not trying to... Uh, in fact, here we'll applaud you for doing that. Don't worry about what anybody else would think, what anybody else says. If you're not right, if you're not where you want to be right now, and you'd like me to pray with you about that, share some things, just raise your hand. And I will assume that we are all where we need to be, but if not, it's hard sometimes in a group of people to do that. If, if you have questions, if you'd like to talk to me about that, I'm available anytime. It's my phone number's in the bulletin. There's the cards out back. You can call me anytime. Um, but with that done, brothers, if you'll come, let's share communion today. Let's remember the way Jesus told us to. Come and get ready. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We read this. It says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given, it, given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so that's what communion is. We're proclaiming the reality that Jesus came and died for us. And that's all it is. It's, it's to remember. It's to remember Jesus. That's why we do this. To remember that I can't earn salvation, but it was provided for me. And so we're going to do that now. We're going to share... <coughs> in the time of remembrance. So we pass up the bread.
So to remember his broken body, that's what we do now. Tim, would you pray? Father, again, we just thank you for this day that you've given to us. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you. He rose from the dead. We can be saved. Now I ask the blessing on this symbol of his broken body. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. So let's remember that his body was broken. Wash away our sin. Praise be to God. Let's all stand. Let's sing, Bless me the tide of tides. And then Jeff, please go. <coughs> Thank you, Lord, for this day. We just thank you for what you did on the cross, Lord. And uh, I just pray, Lord, as we go back to our families today, Lord, to uh, have lunch and dinner, Lord, and just have good conversation, Lord. I pray that your name would come up. I pray that this service would come up, Lord, that uh, people would talk about it, think about it, Lord, and, and not just remember you on this day, Lord, but all year long, yeah. Lord, remember that you were, you took away our sins, Lord. You replaced it. And we just can't thank you enough, Lord, and pray that you just go before us this day and bless each and every one. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.